Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, and last time we left off at verse 57. Interesting, I'm going to say it again because it's kind of interesting trivia. This Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Of the whole Bible it has 176 verses. And I've been told that every single verse mentions the Word of God. Sometimes it uses the word testimony or law or precepts. But uh, statutes, there's another one. And it's referring to the Word of God, the Bible. And interesting that the longest chapter in the Bible mentions the Bible in every verse. It's a big emphasis on the importance of the Bible. Big emphasis. It is important. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus quoted the Bible in every one of his temptations. The Bible tells us that its source is God. There are a lot of books in the world, probably millions and millions of books, is the only one that comes from God. God's Word is the Bible. No wonder it's so important. And it's true. It's without error. And it's powerful. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. One of the things interesting about uh, the uh, Psalm 119 being the longest chapter in the Bible, just two psalms before that, Psalm 117, is the shortest chapter in the Bible. And it's two verses. I like this psalm. I'm going to read it again, Psalm 117. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise Him, all you people. There's the message. It's got the, the first message of that little psalm is praise God. Uh, I tell you what, we're making a big mistake if we look at it negative things and forget to praise God. He's doing all kinds of things in our lives every day. Miracles, opportunities, blessings. And uh, you're, you're going to miss out on a lot if you don't see what God's doing in your life and what He's already done. People make big mistakes because they don't realize God is doing these things and He's blessing you and He's giving you these things. Don't mess it up. Don't lose it. Well, recognize it and thank Him for it. Praise Him. And the thing mentioned in verse 2, for His merciful kindness is great toward us. Now there's something to praise Him about. You're a sinner. God's holy and He's judge. If He wanted to, He would have every right to strike you down and send you down. But guess what? He hadn't done that. Instead, He sent Jesus to be stricken down. Jesus suffered in our place. And now, you know what mercy means? Mercy means God does not punish when you deserve it. That's something to praise Him for. He doesn't punish me even though I deserve it. I better praise Him. I better because that is wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, if Paul said that he's the greatest of sinners, what am I? I'm a lot lower than that. And so I better be thankful for God's mercy. Okay, verse 57 of Psalm 119. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. If you, if God's your portion, another, what's your portion? What you've received. You receive God. If you know Jesus, you have a personal relationship with Jesus. And then you're, if that's true, your goal is going to be the same as what he said in verse 57. You're going to say, I would keep your words. Now what you need is, if you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you need the Bible. And you need to have the attitude, whatever the Bible tells me to do, I'm going to do it. If it tells me to be submitted to authorities, I'm going to be submitted to authorities. If it tells me to pray for those in power, I'm going to pray for those in power. If it tells me to not lie, I'm not going to lie. If it tells me to give to the poor and help others less fortunate than myself, then I'm going to open up my pocketbook and be generous. I have said that I would keep thy words. I just want to know what the Bible says. That's all I want to know. And then I'm going to ask God to help me put it into practice. Verse 58. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. 
Be merciful unto me according to thy word. And so you'll find in Psalm 119, often the writer uses the words with my whole heart. It's like he does in this verse 58. You can't be half-hearted going after God's word and to put it into practice. It's got to be the zeal of your life that you want to read the word, know the word, and put it into practice. And even when you've done that, guess what? You're going to say, oh Lord, I still fall far short. And that's basically what he's saying here because as soon as he says that he's entreated God's favor with his whole heart, he says, be merciful unto me. I still need your mercy, Lord. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner still. I need you to be merciful to me. I rely on your mercy. I need it. According to thy word. Well, where, did, where did the believers find out that God's merciful? Right here. That's what it says. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's the person who went down justified. Jesus said to the woman taken in adultery, Where are your accusers? And she said, There is no man, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. The word tells us about God's mercy. His mercy. It's so wonderful. And that's why you can be confident. I don't understand why people have guilty consciences. Don't they understand? God's merciful. All you have to do is confess and mean it. With true repentance, your goal is to stop doing it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Don't you believe that? Why are you guilty? I'd run to Jesus and confess and then believe that He's forgiven you. That's what I advise you to do. Because the Word says He will. I thought on my ways, verse 59, and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I thought, on, so in other words, he planned. He said, I'm thinking, what direction is my life taking? I'm thinking about that. Let's see, I'm, I'm, these are the things I'm, I'm planning to do. These are the things I'm involved in. These are the decisions I've got to make coming up. And... What does he say about it? I turned my feet into thy testimonies. My feet, where are my feet going to go? Wherever I tell them to go, that's where they're going to go. My mind controls my feet. I think about God's word. That's it. That's, he said. that's what he says. It's what God's testimonies say is what I'm going to tell my feet to do. You're responsible for what you do. Even though we're great sinners, and even though God's merciful, we should do right. Jesus lived on the earth. He never sinned. He's our example. You know what that means? That means we're extremely guilty. We should do what's right. Jesus did what was right. He's our example. He proved it could be done. What that means is when we sin, we're really horrible. We're really sinful. We are guilty when we fail. And therefore, we better run for forgiveness. Verse 60, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. He didn't put it off. Procrastination is the same as uh, sin. Don't ever say tomorrow. You better not say, I'll do it tomorrow when it comes to your soul. Because you may not have tomorrow. You might die today. And if you think you're going to get saved tomorrow, you might wake up in hell tomorrow. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. There's no promise of tomorrow. Your heart is beating. You're one heartbeat away from eternity. You better get saved while you can. God wants to save you today. Procrastination. I delayed not to keep thy commandments. That's one of the big, big sins that Christians commit is procrastination. Oh, do you know the Lord is Savior? Yes, I do. Are you going to a church right now where you're hearing the Word of God? No, I'm not. But I know I need to. And I will soon. Why don't you visit my church? Oh, that's a good idea. I'll plan to visit your church. Where are they? A lot of people have told me that they, because they plan to someday. Not right now. Procrastination. 
And so they're not hearing the word of God. They're not gathering with the other Christians. They're not obeying the Lord who said, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. So much the more as you see the day approaching. The bands of the wicked have robbed me. He said, wicked people have done me, have done me in. They've, they've, they've done bad things to me. I've suffered. I've suffered from wicked people, but I have not forgotten thy law. No matter what I suffer, I'm still going to turn to the Lord and do his word. I'm not going to let that discourage me. The bad things that people have done against me. The attacks, the accusations, the condemnations. I'm not going to let any of that turn me from seeking the Lord and doing what the Bible says. I'm not going to let it. If you do let it, then you'll stop following the Lord, I'll tell you. Because you're going to have attacks. It's a part of the Christian life. The servant's not greater than his Lord. And look what they did to Jesus. Verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. If you can't sleep at night, here's some good advice. Pray and thank the Lord for the things he's told us in his word. We've always got that. If they take everything else away from you, can't take away your salvation, and they can't take away the Bible. You'll always have the Bible. You may, have, you may not have a roof over your head. You may not have a car to drive, but you'll always have the Bible, and especially the Bible verses that you've memorized. Verse 63 I'm a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. So what he's saying is, he's joining in with the other Christians. One of the things that leads Christians astray, they get involved in the wrong crowd. Christian young people, it often happens to them. The public school's a dangerous place for a Christian young person. There's a lot of people there partying, drinking, taking drugs, and doing other things that are immoral. Ungodly, and many a young person from a Christian family has been enticed down the wrong way because they did not make a decision like this writer made in verse 63 who said, I'm a companion of those that fear God. I'm not a companion. I'm not joining in with those that don't fear God. It's good for marriage too. And of them that keep thy precepts. It's not those that say they believe. It's those that are putting them into practice. That Jesus said is the ones which should be our close friends. A companion, close friends. Christians are supposed to be close friends with each other because we're all serving the Lord together. And verse 64. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. So once again, he's, when you think about God, I mean, he keeps coming back to the word mercy because he knows he's a sinner and he knows he's constantly dependent upon God's mercy and he's thankful for that. And then he says, wherever I look, I see God's mercy. Well, look, there's a person who doesn't even know Jesus is Savior and yet they're blessed. Every day they're blessed. Why doesn't God strike them down? They heard the gospel many times, and yet their heart's hard. No, God's merciful. That's why he's merciful to them. Now look at that person over there, that Christian. They're serving the Lord. How could they be serving the Lord? I knew them growing up. They're serving the, how could they be serving the Lord? God is merciful. That's how. And he says, teach me thy statutes. Not enough just to read the Bible. You've got to know what it means. And only the Holy Spirit can teach you God. Must be your teacher. God's the teacher. Uh, the cults use this. They got it all wrong. Why? They didn't learn from God. They're using a human knowledge and a human understanding. And it takes them the wrong way. Only the Spirit of God can enlighten you with the truth of God's Word. And so he's, 
He's asking that. He's praying that to the Lord. You think about each one of these verses are prayers to God. It's the writer addressing God in each one of these verses. So in verse 65, his prayer to the Lord is, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. You, you did good things for me, Lord. You've done good things for me, Lord. And it's exactly what the Bible said you would do. Can you think of any verses that tell us that? Well, I like I like the last verse, uh, the sixth verse of the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so if you, you should be able to, if you understand what God's been doing in your life and you're appreciative, you should be able to look at your life and say, wow, God has done a lot of good things for me. Some people dwell on the negative. Everyone has negative things, but don't dwell on them. Look at the good things God's done for you. This person had bad things in their life, but what did they say? They didn't talk about the bad things in this verse. They said, you've done bountifully with me, Lord. You've done good things for me, Lord. You've done well. In other words, good for me. And he calls himself God's servant. I'm just your servant, Lord. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I surrender my will to you. I'm not going to live my life the way I want it. I just ask for your will to be done. I'm here ready and willing to serve you, Lord. Hear my Lord. Send me. Verse 66. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. For I have believed thy commandments. So again, he's asking God to teach him. Another theme he keeps coming back to. The word of God's wonderful, but only God can teach it to me. Only he can open my eyes so I see its importance and apply it to my life. What part of it applies to me now where I'm at in my life today? Teach me good judgment. That means I'm going to be making decisions. I need discernment and understanding to understand this situation and what should I do now I need it from the Lord you don't want to be making your own decisions in life it says for I have believed your commandments I believe that it's true but that's not enough I've got to have God teach me so that I have understanding and the ability to make good judgments that means make good deci good decisions before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. And so what he's saying here is, uh, tribulation worketh patience. There's a good reason for the difficult things that come into our lives. Paul said, it's the thorn of the flesh. A thorn in the flesh made him stronger because it made him turn to the Lord more. God's our strength. Before he was afflicted, he went astray. And you know, when things were good, and that happens to people, well, things are going good now. I got plenty of money. I, uh, everything's going good. I've got my house and my car. And uh, I'm healthy. And uh, people are less likely to turn into the Lord in that situation. And... It's really true. And God uses something called chastisement. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receives. The way to avoid chastisement is to be quick to confess your sins. If you're not quick to confess, God loves you and he wants to make something out of you. So he's going to do things to get your attention. And he knows how to do it. Uh, about a year after I was saved, he got my attention. I fell on a basketball court and sprained my ankle. To this day, it's the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. The instant I, that it happened, I knew it was the Lord chasing me. Even though I didn't know much about the Bible yet, I knew that was the hand of God saying, Hey, you better change your attitude, Christian. Uh, the way you're thinking is wrong. And he really got my attention. And I can say, just like this man said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I have kept thy word. The affliction, the chastisement was just what I needed to get me back on track according to God's word. 
And so he says in verse 68, Thou art good and doest good. I always want to remember that. That's an important teaching. God is good. I mean, there's a little old saying we used to have. I heard it before I was saved. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And that's an important statement right here. God is good. Thou art good. And do us good. God always does good. He's the only one that does good, by the way. Everyone else sins. God always does good, and he's in control. Therefore, what he does is for a good reason, his reason. Always remember that. That'll help you through some difficult times. God always does what's good. Whatever touches your life, God's involved in it, and God is good. He knows what he's doing. He has a plan, a good plan. That's where Romans 8.28 comes from. All things work together for good. There it is. There's that word again. And so he just says, teach me thy statutes. There it is again. He asks it again. It's a common prayer. I need God to teach me the Bible. I need him to teach me. He's my teacher. And I'm asking, and it's, it's a prayer that he makes. Lord, teach me. Touch my heart. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep the precepts with my whole heart. Once again, the writer talks about the spiritual warfare of serving God. There's a spiritual warfare. The powers of darkness don't want you to get saved. Once you are saved, they don't want you to bear fruit for the Lord. They don't want you to stay in fellowship with Jesus. And so they're going to attack you. They're going to make difficulties for you. Not all the time, but there will be times. There will be an evil day when the people of evil, inspired by the dark forces, will come against your heart, mind, soul, and life. And what does this guy say he does? He's determined to do what's right, no matter who the enemies are, no matter what they do against them. And one of the worst things that can happen is be lied about. They forged a lie against me. Nothing worse than that. That's exactly what happened to Jesus when he was taken to court and lied about. They lied about him. That was all that they could do was lie because he never did anything wrong. They lied about him. They're going to lie about you. Someone somewhere along the line will lie about you. It won't be true what they say, but it'll hurt. It'll be like a flaming arrow shot into your heart. It'll hurt. What do you do? Be resolved. Be determined. Nothing's going to keep you from seeking the Lord and obeying Him, following Him, and doing what the Word of God says. You can be resolved like that. I'm going to do what the Lord wants. I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to do what He wants. I mean, that could happen here, right? I could preach a sermon and someone could come in that door and make all kinds of accusations against me. It might happen. What will I be able to do about it? I'll be able to do exactly what this person did. I'll be able to be resolved that I'm going to serve the Lord the best I know how. It happened to Jesus. They went out there when he was praying. He's having a prayer meeting and they grab him and put handcuffs on him and drag him off and start lying about him. Right in the middle of a prayer meeting. And it happens in this world. So better to be ready. You never know what's going to come against you. The only thing you need is in, in your heart you want to serve the Lord. You're going to serve the Lord no matter what happens. And we should because Jesus died for us. That's why we should. And we're his servants. And we believe in him. Whatever happens to us, he brings our way. We rely on his mercy. We love the Bible. We read it. We believe it. And we depend on him to teach us. We depend on him to teach us what he wants us to learn from it. And uh, isn't that wonderful? No wonder we have this psalm as the longest book, the longest chapter of the, of the whole Bible. And we're not even halfway through it yet. It's wonderful, isn't it? 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for Psalm 119. Help us to always value your word. Help us to spread it, read it, study it, teach it, uh, because it's so wonderful and so important. Forgive us for any moment of any day where we haven't done that. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.